Morning, Julie. Good evening, Ed. This is Ed Reether in the Boston area on the 16th of December, and Julie is in Australia on the 17th of December. Yes. And Amazing. Going... It's the end of the year almost. And we're going into winter, and you're going into <laughs> summer. Yep. Yep. Mm. So thank you for taking my call. I'm looking forward to our discussion tonight. We haven't spoken in a number of weeks and we have some um, what you might call dangling participles mm. hanging out from previous discussions in the discussions about the seventh stage demonstration of Arida. Mm. Mm. And since you were so intimately connected to him personally and bodily through many of these transformations and beginnings of this full, might you call the brightening process. Um, I think from what I've heard from everybody, what you're saying and how you're sharing your understanding is very valuable. And so I wanna continue on with this discussion in mm. that manner. Yeah, thank you. Yes. All right. So so before we get into uh, the, the specifics, uh, personally, I, I do a lot of work, as you know, on the B zone it, with the teachings of, of Arida. And today I sent out something about his, how he came to be. What brought him here? Mm -hmm. And and um, and this is from a period of time called the Pleasure Dome. It was 1996, I believe. He was bringing into the discussion about the the woman, the 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 the, the lack of Shakti that was being demonstrated in the community. But what the Shakti or the he is she and that kind of duality, which he represents both, if you will, principles of the male and the female. But but the energetic quality mm -hmm. is really what 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 I would, mm -hmm. what he was bringing. And as he brought it, what I brought out today was that he he his manifestation is a response to the calling or the invocation of, of, of not only his devotees, but the world. Yeah. The, the time, the time has brought him here. And in that discussion, in that uh, talk that I put out today, he was pointing out a couple of things and this is going to tie into what we were speaking about earlier. Sure. Is that, he didn't come here with a plan, meaning, and he also wasn't a he that came here. This is this is the divine itself. And, and of course, nobody would know that unless they had recognition, because when I say that, that is implying that there is some recognition, mm -hmm. because if I said that on its own, it would sound too preposterous to say, yes. Right. So, yes. so, so I want to make sure I'm not just speaking to devotees, I'm speaking to as what he has, what he is talking about. He's talking about the world has called the divine into manifestation. Right? Yes, yes. Right. As, as his, as, as bright form. Yes, as. As bright form. Yes. So, so, so I want to go into another earlier, uh, talk that I was asked to put together and it had to do with the uh, 
the early 1974 garbage in the goddess period to come, the the Avon lady and mm. uh, um, the, the gorilla sermon and uh, and so so there are two 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 parts to what I'm trying I, I will get to is 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 the, the the divine incarnation and and the process because it was a process for him as it was for everybody associated and directly or not directly mm, because mm. because I have to the background of this is the world this is not just the foreground is the devotee the background is the world so we're speaking in the foreground background. We're speaking about the world process, but we're also speaking about an individual process. Mm. <clears throat> and in the beginning, and I'll go back to that Avon period, the Avon lady, is that his emphasis was on the fundamental issue of the self-contraction. The separation, which he says is primarily what is preventing the understanding, mm. Mm. the full understanding mm. of who he is, because there is a separation. There is this holding on through very subtle mechanisms. This is mm. not just mm. a mind mm. form, mm. right? This yeah. is a very subtle and, and if you wanted causal. So, so here I wanted to just say we have a we have a demonstration. I can hear his early 1974 revelation in the same manner as I'm speaking when he's talking in the 1996 period of time, or even into the 2008 period of time. He's mm -hmm. always bringing it, but the, the the what is different is the is the is the is the fullness mm. is the is the mm. fullness that coming through mm. so mm. there's this this process mm. that he in his own work and mm. you were a part you were a you were you were intimately connected to this 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 brightening that mm. really in if you will the end right of his uh, was fully just that mm. Mm. where mm. in the early period of time it was it was in if you will the background and what was in the foreground was the 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 self contraction the, the, yeah the, yeah the, this so tying this together with the the, the brightness the 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 seventh mm. stage demonstration which was initiated if you will i hope and i'll just throw it to you in 1986 and magnified in 1999 at the brightness mm. and maybe we could since we've already talked about the 1986 period of time and mm. your association mm. with Adi Da at that time mm. maybe you could start with that what what was what was occurring in that 1999 event at the yeah. brightness which you were yeah yeah Prior to just speaking about that, I also just want to acknowledge that um, what you have offered to consider is very significant and profound. Um, so thank you for being able to speak about Adida in this context. And also that there were many points, very significant ones again, that you pointed to in the course of his life demonstration and our coinciding with him, his coinciding with us. And um, when you speak about uh, the, uh, the pleasure dome period of time, you know, the uh, quandra mama, which was also something we have spoken about previously that initiated or catapulted him into the, the world, so to speak, in a, in a more direct way and calling out to others beyond just the um, devotees he had been working with. I, we, we spoke about that and the significance of that period of time. Um, and the reason I wanted to just bring that up is because it will tie in with what um, I'm going to describe in the 1999 brightness event, because there are a lot of um, manners in which he worked with various individuals that those actual um, confessions, the ecstatic confessions that were both 
are, were always coupled with um, what, what we would call his left foot and his beauty foot. <laughs> you know, the, the, um, his left foot is the beauty foot and his right foot, you know, as the power foot or the fire. Um, and this is his, this is his person that um, enables all of these moments that you're speaking of to be a, a leela of, of demonstration of both a lesson that was necessary to be taught or to instruct about or to give in all the different ways that he did, whether he was whatever, um, whether it was in what he would describe as his seventh stage demonstration of transfiguration, transformation, indifference, and outshining. And also the, all of those words were often interchangeable with all of the numerous recapitulations, you know, and re-examinations and then summary conclusions, you know, that would then lead us on to another point of basically him saying the same thing over and over and over and over again. And the only reason that it appeared to be different in the context of each of these events as an apparent progression was simply because uh, the, the recognition was not um, present in the eyes and heart of his devotees to a fully sufficient degree so that he had to keep on instructing or giving more that we would describe to be his right foot or the fire foot, you know, that is about, always about the direct address to the ego act itself that is actually the creation of attention, mind, sense of separate self, the whole way in which we live collectively and apparently individual in the relationship to the first six stages of life, which we have spoken about. So the seventh stage way that he has demonstrated is um, was always an address to that. And then simultaneously, uh, that could only be revealed through recognition, um, which was the simultaneous recognition of his transmission of the divine self condition that is native and natural and true to everyone and everything. And, and there is only one, not one other, but the, co the condition. Now, this is, this is what is very, this, this ground, this condition, this intuitive feeling reception of his transmission of the bright, which is felt very uniquely and completely identified as his person and, and presence and state of being. Um, and it is not, it is entirely unique, yogically and different from any of the samadhis within the first six stages of life. Now that doesn't negate those as anything lesser than or not being, you know, profound, but um, Adi Da's revelation is a culmination of a radical understanding of the entire form of embodiment in relationship to the manner in which divine influences or forces have manifested through time and space. So um, this uh, yoga of the feeling reception of his person, presence and state awakening into the state of being by virtue of the recognition. Within that context, he's saying this condition is always already the case. And this is what he repeatedly said in the knee of listening was his primary communication of that. And so um, throughout all the years in these constant recapitulations, re-examinations and rewritings and new books, he'd always say, this is new, this is new, this is new, this is a way to look at it, this is a way to consider and feel it because I'm not getting through to you. Everything in me is giving you everything I can possibly give. You know, this was the force of his being and presence was literally always melting fully into being given over to any and everything that coincided with him without recoil. So that the force of everything that you felt in his company was unimpeded. You know, it was pure. It was raw. It was spontaneous. It was immediate. Um, it wasn't planned, as you say. And um, so just to set the feeling um, reception of his person in terms of what you spoke about, the pleasure dome that ties in with the yoga of the ability to understand what he's speaking about um, in and as the bright and what was initiated at the brightness event. Um, brings everything full spherically round circle into his fundamental primary communication about the purpose of his embodiment, which is the outshining brightness to be, to establish all in the kiln 
of that. And in, in fact, that is the that is the true nature and being of what is really actually occurring and happening and is the truth of our condition. But he's simply suggesting observe and understand. Notice this. This is the truth. And even if I'm to speak to you in fairly radical terms, you know, relative to high um, at every level of the body mind, you can speak truth to the being and the being will know it. In other words, it will intuitively sense the truth of it. And he said that is native in every being. This somehow hidden and not able to be accessed, it seems, you know, and yet there's always this yearning for what? Unqualified love. <laughs> We're all yearning for this unqualified love. And the the gift in Adi Da's company of recognition is one of this, the reception of the awakening into this condition, not merely as an experience, but the ground upon which the whole process occurs is this fundamental recognition responsive yoga. So at Quandra Mama, um, his, um, with those who were most intimately related to him, and it was women who were involved in it um, bodily intimately at times, not all of them, just a few of them. And men who were there also who would enter into the consideration with this. Adida was never intimate with any men, let me make that very clear. <laughs> his embodied form is his male <laughs> lioness, lion prowess rather. Um, we are lionesses. <laughs> So it seems, but he his communication uh, was about, OK, what would it be like if we lived this intimate in love yoga 24 seven forever and eternally and it was never lost? And he's not speaking about this as a mind Dharma. Right. <laughs> he's speaking about this as. Manifest here. A male form, a female form, so it seems. In relationship to a Siddha master, unquestionably so, whatever objections anybody may have, there is no question whatsoever of, of the profound intervention that Adida's life is. At, at so many different levels and everyone can really appreciate that if if their heart is simply open to be compassionately cooperatively tolerant to actually feel the realities that have manifested here and what the significance of them are adida is one that should never be ignored you know or just wiped off the shelf that's not a very heartfully intelligent thing to do really when you truly understand his purpose and function. So he's simply at Quandramama here. I mean, I could tell a long Leela of my own, but that I, I think for purposes of what we're trying to address here, that might be a little bit long. But on the other hand, what it what it was the revelation of is what he would call the um, the yoga of true intimacy. And the women and the men who viewed what Adi Da did as an emotional sexual character, as a, as a master, you know, I mean, a, a master that was always and only um, making use of body minds as vessels, literal vehicles and vessels to bring down and to conduct the bright force of being and to envelop and to awaken and delight and enchant <laughs> so that the invocation from our heart was more <laughs> or enough or sufficient or yes, you know, this is incomparable joy and bliss and love and it's never lost. So this essence of our consideration with one another as the recognition that this is the true condition, this is there is only one and that seed having been planted as reality, sadhana had to be done. So the consideration of the sadhana is. What are you doing so that it appears as though that's not always the case? 
You know, that, that's not, no matter what you do, this truth cannot be destroyed. It cannot go away. There is no away from it. Everything is arising in it. So it, again, at Quandra Mama then, it was the, when, when I am intimate with you, whole bodily, including genitals, toes, feet, blood, sweat, tears, everything that the embodied form is, pervaded by and awakened into the absolute full awakening oneness of, oh, my dear, there is only one. There is only one. Not I am the same as you, or you are the same. There is only one. And then we, we dance and move and love in the joy of recognition of non-difference, no separation. So that the heart is at ease and at rest and totally sufficient in the self-sufficiency of the nature and being of the divine reality self, which is literally our own conscious feeling aware being being consumed, outshined, awakened into, not annihilation of manifestation, like the body-mind still arises, things will still arise. So it's not like death, as you might conceive it, that occurs when you are identified with the psychophysical mechanism that has its apparent beginnings and endings. But what Adi Da is speaking to, which is what the great, the link to the great tradition of, of um, of humanity, you know, with the highest of nirvikalpa samadhis, the, the wise, the experienced, the souls, the siddhas, the, the masters, the yogis and yoginis, all the ones that have come um, that seem to be from elsewhere, but only as an aspect of this divine condition that we arise in. It's always the communication to dance with, surrender into, and acknowledge the divine is present. And as and in this, what is described, what you're addressing as the late time, this ability to have it be accepted or even acknowledged or to be okay that the spirit condition and conscious being, however that may have been pointed to or named in all the great traditions of humanity, that was taboo to even to be acknowledged as being truth. And presently now it's, utterly taboo because the ego separate self is entirely the temple of worship. The perpetuation of that utterly utter refusal to surrender into its true condition, that its independence is absolutely being maintained most fiercely. And why? Because we seem to be um, identifying with the manifest form um, that we would feel that if it died, we would die. Therefore, our, we have misplaced our, our sense of identity in relationship to what is arising. And Adi Da is saying, yeah, exactly. What are you doing? And so in the Quandra Mama, again, it was that was exactly that consideration. How do we live in the full, like full bodied bliss of showing the signs of in love yoga? Um, <laughs> perpetual fuck. Is, is is fuck a taboo word? Maybe it's a little bit slang, but you know, it's like, it, it, it's to the point of what Bhagavan is about. <laughs> um, the, you know, no union, it's, it's actual oneness, this whole spherical context within which we are awakened into. Um, that's the yoga of the love bliss where everyone and everything is recognized as the beloved that is the one that is invoking this dissolution of any sense of separate self and that is the actual context of the yoga and practice and so here let's move forward um, to 1999 and th this is the segue to that is at, from you know year to year and even day to day in in beloved's company we would be observing like eons of seeming time and space and place and apparent others being worked with. And this is something I cannot emphasize enough is that while there was all of our pettiness going on, you know, as these gross body, body mind personas and all the different configurations that we created, Adi Dog did not create what happened around him. He was responsive in the coinciding. And he played the roles 
that always ended up giving a lesson about the right or the wrong relationship to his manifestation in relationship to truth. Now, some people will suggest that that's maybe just an argument for us to justify what appears to be terrible things that he did, you know, <laughs> or questionable things or controversial. Um, no, that's, that's not what I'm suggesting here at all. I'm not going to excuse Adi Da for anything that he did or didn't do. Um, that is a consideration for each individual being to come to terms with in relationship to the divine process itself. And that's the way in which to relate to Adi Da and everything that he offers is you have to be very serious about realization. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand what it is that you're coming for, which is it is not in any way, shape or form going to satisfy seeking or egoic intentions, perpetual confrontation and confounding in paradox. There will be no nothing to stand on whatsoever. The mind has no use apart from a functional purpose. Truly, everything that is arising as body, mind, sense of self is simply a mechanism to be yielded. Every form of agency that he, agency that he gave which is, you know, his, his bodily presence, his sanctuaries, you know, his image art, his literature, um, his leelas, true leelas of his life, which is what we're speaking about now, is that he, um, the reception of his agencies and being able to make use of his manifestation and what he said he completed in his in initiated the completion of it in 1999 is that he literally gave everything everything to serve in the process of the awakening of those who are in his observation not noticing that what they're doing in terms of barring themselves and one another from the truth of the divine self condition in which conflict and unhappiness would be dissolved. Um, that was the purpose of, of his life, no matter what it may have appeared to be. And the test of the yoga of intimacy was to stay in the in love disposition, like blown out into the context of the full bodily reception of his person and being. You know, fullness of every part of the being such that you feel it wiggle your toes, you know, and you'd often, as he would describe, <laughs> see the undulations and, and the open, the brilliance of, of, of um, every aspect of how he would function. And I'm not creating some sort of mythological figure here. I'm talking about this is a tangible person with a body that had pores you know, all the dealings with the limitations of what individuals have to deal with in terms of dealing with symptoms and, and life and everything that he did affected him very tangibly in this way. And as we attended to him, um, particularly during these events that you're speaking of, um, it always involved a crisis at every level of the being. And the impact of that crisis in terms of his own psychophysical mechanism at every level above and below and beyond would have a significant impact in relationship to hundreds of thousands of people and not only on this manifest level but at many different levels and so in 199 and and yet Adi Da would always say okay well that's not enough it's not enough because what's required here for me bodily is I need to see and be guaranteed that there is a vehicle or a mechanism of enough bodies uh, that are a vessel for me to be able to manifest through um, because I won't be here forever. You know, I, I, I will be leaving this place. So any form of relating to me that is tying me here by virtue of your egoic attention must be undone. You, you have to relate to me as I am, as you are, as is truth itself. Let go 
of a sense of separate identity and self through this radical understanding that I give you and awaken in your recognition of me. If you do not recognize me, then you will not be able to see your act that you are superimposing upon the context within which this relationship exists. So it was always about the direct relationship, the direct relationship. So in 1999, after a whirlwind yajna, you know, of, of, of uh, again out into discovering what's happening with devotees in all different parts of the world, what's happening in the world, you know, more apart from the fact that he heard news every single day, you know, listened to it and was keyed into what was happening globally. Um, and things were brought to him from people all over the world. In 1999, it was another moment of peak frustration um, because the signs weren't manifesting in terms of the vessel that would be able to set him apart through most profound recognition so that he could enter, you know, really enter most fully so that that would shine bright to be able to continue the physical manifestation of the realization. It has to be embodied, cannot be abstracted. Um, that's the nature and the purpose of his manifestation is to make that clear. It has to be embodied. It can be embodied. The voice of the divine is present in recognition, transcending the self-contraction and the ego act and the truth speaks. The truth speaks. Reality speaks. And his wisdom dharma represents the process through which that ha instruction was given to address the ego act and illusions and delusions and patterning, but then also to um, demonstrate and to transmit the yogic signs that are unique to his manifest person that is all inclusive of every aspect of the um, uh, psychophysical cosmic domain appearance. And so at the brightness, <laughs> the reason I'm speaking so big is I'm kind of trying to set the setting here of what it was like at the brightness in 1999. So the peak of frustration, returning with this frustration, you know, and, and I, I obviously won't get all the details there. And this is why, again, I say this necessity for Leela being told by numbers who were there at the time is essential in present time, not for the future, but in present time to be told and to have people participating in the room so that these things can be transmitted. This is the nature of Leela, the core of culture to, to enable everyone and everything to feel bodily through the bodies of true devotees, the initiatory force of what it is that he transmitted, particularly in these events, and that then continued to manifest in his person. Um, and as he said, an initiation is what is acknowledging what is always already the case. <laughs> so you have the paradox right there. Now, a shift or a spell is broken, further uh, integration has occurred, greater emanate, greater em emergence has occurred, um, uh, signs of recognition maybe, testings happening and going on, it's like a constant, you know, outshining machine and, and lesson machine, you know, <laughs> where there's as in with the in love yoga, there's the incision and there's the bliss and there's the fullness, there's the responsiveness, there's the um, non-separateness, there's the enjoyment, you know, there's the going beyond, um, there's the letting go, there's the giving, there's the reception, there's all of this in the context of the in love yoga. The relationship has to be lived directly, this viscerally tacitly and tangibly in the body and lived in relationship to everyone and everything. That's it. All of the rest of it, as he describes, has been an address to beginners who haven't really recognized this profundity. So the, the 1999 event was about that his own every time that there was one of these significant events that occurred for him that some people glibly call some sort of psychotic break or something which is just i mean they discount their 
intelligence, excuse me, by saying such things, their heart intelligence. It's, it's a dramatization. It's a rejection of the beloved. It's, you know, because it's his confessions are none other than what is truth itself for all and all. Literally so. Um, not abstract at all. So what he would do in these events is that if there wasn't the sign of reception, what did he do? Profound consideration into his function, the response or non-response in relationship to what he had given. Have I not given enough? What have I not done? What have I not addressed? What have I not said? What are you missing? What are you not getting? What don't you get? I've been repeating myself for decades, not only you know, verbally, but whole bodily, you know, we've all been given over and, and the signs, where are the signs? Yes, there have been gifts, number, huge numbers of gifts, even millions of dollars of gifts and even, you know, incredible response in certain levels of helping me do what I've had to do and manifest my demonstration. But the only reason I'm here is for the response, the essence of the yoga that sets me apart from what the ego act is doing on me. So in 1999, he was again repeating to the entire gathering, you are not in right relationship to me. You aren't even true devotees because you haven't heard me. You have not, you're not demonstrating hearing and seeing as a, as a culture of responsibility for these gifts yet. If you were the signs of the growth and attraction of the gathering of my devotees would be doing its mission in the world. And I'm not gonna be here forever. You have to manifest my form as a Sangha, as a true Sangha, in order for my function and initiatory force and intervention to intervene in a fashion in which the seventh stage way can be authenticated in relationship to the gifts I've given. So he, in, we land, when we landed there, he went up to, the, to what he had established as his Maha Samadhi site. He established this site prior to his death and gave very, very precise instructions about what should be done and what should be followed and what should occur and indicated where he would be and that nobody would live up there and that there would be certain places where when there were actual real practitioners in the advanced and ultimate stages, they could. there's a certain place they could live or there would be certain services done. I mean, it was all, and he would, this would be the place that he would um, go to. <laughs> which was called a Sukra Kendra. And he had a, which was his temple, private, private. And, and I've, I've had the blessing and as have many women had the blessing of being able to serve and men, you know, for creating it and building it and, and housing all of the empowerment articles in there and extraordinary, most extraordinary and pristine temple. The main thing is the utter pure stillness, but but alive in alive, not not no thing, no one, no being, but alive as this love bliss that is so profoundly sufficient. His and, and in those spaces, he would bring himself into his own process of, we have not a clue, <laughs> really. <laughs> you know, as a Siddha, how can we know? We don't know anything about it, but in observing this, um, and it's, it's written about by number of people, and number of people have told the story in different ways, um, but he, um, there, he was working with what, uh, an event that was occurring in the world called the Kosovo War. And um, this is not uncommon when there were major events, as would be so with many great realizers or true yogi saints or sages. They would, be, they would be offering themselves for the purpose of world service. You know, this would be the reason for realization, not for self purposes, but for, the, for, for mankind, you know, for the sake of the, for the divine itself, for love itself being obvious in this hell of unlove and endings, apparent, and, and temporary pleasures that are always passing. So Adi does at the brightness, huge thunderstorms. I mean, the, the kind of cracking thunderstorms that literally open up the sky. 
beyond what is physically considered to be the dome, you know, above. It's just cracking so loud that it reverberates through every, every cell of your being and the light. And the, this went on for quite a while, not like a day, days and days. You know, it was really strong. And there were only a few of us who were actually serving him while he was at the brightness. And these were devotees who had, including myself and, and Jacqueline, Nick, and um, uh, Stanley, and, and EO, and, and Nadi Kanta, and um, Sukapur, and uh, um, yes, yes, I can see him. I can't remember his name. <laughs> anyway. Just a few, because Adi Dot would wanted to be alone in the process he was involved in, and what he was doing. I don't know altogether, but it was clear it was really significant and profound, and it was at a peak of frustration with feeling the non-response, the sufficient response that would provide him with the mechanism and the uh, that he required, apart from just the establishment of his treasures, um, as we've described. So here he is, and in at the brightness and. Um, one night I had this dream where I was on a ride, like a Ferris wheel or a roller coaster, and I was sitting in a seat with Beloved next to me. It was black and white, and um, we both turned around, and behind us was um, Chit Velasananda and Baba Muktananda, and they were sitting in the, 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 the car behind. And um, just in noticing them, I felt intuitively in the dream state He's, this is something Adi does working with. You know, this was obvious. And there was a, something needed to be clarified, is the feeling of it, because it was a bit dark, elusive figures, and, and um, yeah. So when I woke up that morning, and this is not uncommon, is that when Adi Da wakes up, you know, um, we know that, and immediately there are, um, gifts that are brought to him that can help him do his work in different ways, um, including if he's working on a manuscript of his writing or if there is a, um, uh, something that's being brought to him by a question that he asked and he needed an answer to. Or um, Now, this was still going on while he was up to the, at the brightness to a certain degree. And so this morning, um, Sukapur and Nadi Kanta would go up and, and serve him and bring things back. And then um, Nick and Joseph, Joseph, they were the ones who were bringing things up, you know, to a certain point and receiving them. And then we were preparing down at the entrance and across the way for all of what was required and cleaning the place where Adi Da would sometimes at the towards at one point come down to the to where we were. And there was um, and uh, when we were participating in this kind of a, an event with him, the whole body is combined with what's occurring with him. And so there's no there's no like waking, dreaming or sleeping anymore. It's just riveted to the process of what is occurring with his being and aware that we're there just to serve the best that we possibly can. Um, and while receiving both the beauty foot and the the, um, <laughs> the fiery foot, you know, the power foot simultaneously all the time. And then we receive a yellow pages where he began to address and speak to the lineage of Baba Muktananda, Nichinanda. Um, all of the uh, um, predecessors, so to speak, or links, or um, the, the great tradition, um, his relationship to the vehicles that served his manifestation. And um, there is the lineage essay that was written as a result of this period of time that has also changed over time. But this lineage essay was very key to what he was doing at the brightness. And the reason that I want to bring this up is because his relationship to the great tradition has everything to do with what we're talking about relative to the way that all beings tend to relate to the divine that is less than full recognition. And partly what Adi Da in his recapitulation does is he speaks he speaks as the bright self condition through the mechanisms of his coinciding as a body mind and already had demonstrated the transfiguration, transformation and indifference and, and beginning to um, go through this crisis of, of 
of understanding that there's only been a certain level of response and how does he continue and what is his relationship to all of this? How does it go forward or what the heck? Um, just a peak of, of uh, um, another demonstration of his being fully bodily whole aspect being given over to whatever it was that was necessary to be spontaneously revealed. And in that when I first received the yellow page and started reading what he had written in his in his on his slate and up at the brightness with the thunderstorms going on and all of us being our ridiculous selves that we are playing cartoon characters down below running around like <laughs> mad hatters you know <laughs> relating to the best of our ability that we could to try to serve the magnitude of his person and uh without being like i'm not talking about being silly dumb cultists in in the sense well yes we had to recognize things about that but i'm talking about him you know, being aware of, of the process that was occurring for him. And um, so I wasn't being stupidly enamorous or anything. I'm talking about real tangible spiritual and yogic awareness that had already been awakened in my relationship to him. So the ability for this yoga was something he was calling me to be responsible for, this perpetual in love yoga, and thus to be able to evaluate and to comprehend his, um, and, and authenticate in my own person, his confessions and revelation. Um, so when I received this yellow page, there was something that really took me back that I want to share with you. And um, this is, um, I don't even know if anybody's really spoken much about this, but the reason I bring this is to help you feel how embodied, fully embodied and heart present on, and fully aware of, even while there has been the dissolution of separate self identity through the demonstration of the transcendence of Franklin Jones and even all the other names that he took on throughout the course of his role you know, and function as divine avatar and the demonstrator of what the seventh stage process is really all about. A way of life, a completely comprehensive understanding of the fundamental truth of our condition to live in that context. And then that's the way of the heart. That's the way it begins upon that basis. And his life is a demonstration of that, even from very birth or even beyond because there is no birth or death. In, in reality truth, although this is real for the purpose of sadhana to be done here in relationship to this. So he knew that. <laughs> Did he know that? That sounds completely trite to say. I mean, he was the perfect demonstration of the perfect devotee. He keeps saying, not this. <laughs> I'm talking about the one and only that this empty vessel here, this being utterly utterly blown out you know i've given i can all i can and you still don't understand and then it, it's, is that my you know what am i not doing you know it was more being given over in the seventh stage awakened disposition being more given over in the in the um in this process so when he confessed that because i don't have the page in front of me which would be brilliant, you know, so beautiful if, if we could actually see the original version and watch how it progressed. Because that Leela of his own ordeal is significant in terms of what even in the changes that were made as apparent time went on to, to further address um, and to undo, the further address is the undoing and speaking to the act itself and the patterning that needs to understand through self-understanding um, the act that is, is, is actually the only reason why the truth is not obvious because uh, therefore there's nothing to be attained. It's the dissolution of that which presumes there's something to be attained, not the annihilation again. So here he is, he spoke to Baba Muktananda and I can tell you over all the years, he loved Baba Muktananda and any, any teacher or master or Siddha guru, any beloved devotee, all beings with his passionate love for truth itself. That's his, that's love. That's the love of truth itself. And any way in which it manifested with authenticity in the context of a process of divine self revelation 
he would cultivate and love, you know, serve and participate with, um, really have a life with such serious recognition and such serious intent for realization. Um, so in his dialogue with Baba Muktananda, um, in, this is, in this writing that he was doing, he was saying that he was sorry if there was a way in which he did not manifest fully the guru-devotee relationship with him. Now that's me paraphrasing. But it was, it took me back because I realized that, boy, oh, beloved, as, as I would call him, my heart beloved, Da Bhagavan. He was really feeling the heartbreak of, um, and the examination of fully again from at the core and root of the yoga of the necessity for the city yoga tradition to be honored. You know, for that, the essence of that yoga of transmission and duplication and passing on and um, empowering, you know, to what what hadn't he handled and, you know, or that that's my, this is all me talking about it, but this was on the page and again, um, as he wrote every day and the yellow page would come down, there would be a, a revelation from him. His writing was his communication of revealing the process he was going through in terms of his relationship to the great tradition and humanity as a whole. And um, by so-called, by the end of the writing of this lineage essay, which you know did not end, you know, it, it was it, it was a communication of a pro of a process of what is truth and true in relationship to the great tradition. He ultimately needed to make it very clear that of his love and his gratitude, but the also make it very clear the why he did what he had to do and and also how his particular incarnation is unique and encompasses and respects and loves, but is a further communication about the nature of reality and truth. And this realization requires the sacrifice of separate self sense. So there is no attainment or position or role or condition or experience that is to be held on to and made much of. You know, the ego doesn't like to hear that. <laughs> So in, in this communication, it was going through that undulations of feeling the, oh, the for, saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, I, again, it was like, whoa, he's saying he's sorry. And then feeling the implications of that. Like, I've, he said he has, is sorry or said he may have made mistakes. But as his function of Siddha Guru, it was always acknowledged that um, there was a kind of perfection in the way that he coincided, although not as the creator or the doer. That was something he always made very clear. His, the way he existed or persisted was not his creation. It was the response to what was being brought in relationship to him. And so the exaggeration of the individuals were played out in this dynamic. Of, of the way that he was either working or transmitting or serving or instructing. So this, having seen his and observing his dialogue with Baba Muktanan and these great beings that are implicated in all of this in this lineage essay was remarkably significant. And these kinds of events imprint, so to speak, in the being, um, even if, um, and at a very significantly profound level, particularly when you consider that um, many of us actually received that implant viscerally. You know, the seeded was um, something that cannot be forgotten. What, it can, what can happen is this in relationship to it. That is not yoga. Therefore, any experience of mind, body, and sense of separate self is not about the true reality process. Therefore, it's not true Leela. It's only, as he would describe it, uh, the seeker on the way or Raymond on the way. You know, it, it, it's, it's not having dropped the egg, you know, of the ego I sense and the separate sense of self and all of the kind of mummery play of the he and the she. Um, 
So the vulnerability of feeling him going through this again, and I observe this kind of process in him constantly, literally from 1976, you know, repeatedly over and over again. And he was the one that endured the most significantly profound ordeal in the midst of everything he did with anyone and anything. And he literally wore those wounds on his body. He also enjoyed the bliss of the recognition when it did happen. And when there was a response that served to enable his demonstration, you see, but even our service to enable his demonstration to accomplish what he was even able to do at the brightness, you know, don't mistake how grateful he, how grateful ever, never, never forget or, that he was incredibly grateful for what was being given with him to him by thousands of people and even people that we don't even know what, how they were participating in the process with him. You know, literally get that, allow the wideness to be so wide that you recognize seriously the mind cannot conceive or comprehend the magnitude of the work of the siddhas. You know, so no matter how profound one may presume themselves to be, <laughs> get real. <laughs> it's like a grain of sand, you know, a ripple on the ocean. Um, and that's not like to say spit on you. No, it's not at all that. It's valuing what is sacred, the true nature of everyone and everything, and then participating in that bright yoga. So he, this event there was the process again of the turmoil of the consideration and the examination and the sacrifice required and the fire and the severing and the undoing and the being on the precipice and then falling in and falling over and then feeling the fullness of his being and the resolution. You know, that process was constant and it is constant. And again, in that moment, then he initiated um, and showed us how um, vulnerably, unreservedly you must participate in relationship to what comes into your sphere through real, true reality consideration. It's not like the teaching years were the reality consideration, then reality consideration has ended. No, the actual real process of reality consideration only truly begins based on hearing and seeing. You see, so our, um, and many people have also been gifted these gifts. It's not like they're not present, that you cannot destroy <laughs> what is always already the case or the yoga itself has its laws and it, it cannot be changed or be any different. Um, so this is his perpetual demonstration. He was always a demonstration of the integrity of the process and his devotion to love, unqualified love itself. Fearlessly so to be able to be free to address what was necessary in relationship to everyone and everything. And this is in part why it was necessary for him to have these places of sacred um, retreat you know, to be able to go through this kind of, of um, unimpeded ordeal of, of um, whatever may occur and happen. And sometimes it was loud and sometimes it wasn't at all. There was as much work being done in a moment in which there was utter stillness. Those were the most precious times in the sense of feeling his enjoyment of our enjoyment, just enjoyment itself. And that those were the moments where this is the eternal time. Nothing needs to be added. And that was the, the that is the brightness. That is the brightness. And yet in the midst of that, the work that is being done is necessary. But it's only really divine Leela if it exhibits and demonstrates a lesson learned and change is made and transfiguration, transformation, and difference outshining is then initiated and demonstrated. That's the beginning of the process and the beginning of the way based on recognition, hearing, and seeing. That is radical root yoga. Radical root yoga is radical understanding. It is reality intelligence. It is the bright. So there's no, you, you know, you can't summarize the teaching 
particularly in light of actually really observing his life and process, really feeling what he experienced in his confessions. They're not lies. They're not exaggerations. They're actually quite, they may seem, uh, people who interpret it in a way that is negating the profundity of his person, um, is, it's understandable, but it, it is mine that's doing that. It is the ego act. It is the recoil from that which one does not yet understand. And that's not like saying, you piece of shit. Not at all. You know, it, it's with compassion of, of the heart to acknowledge that we're all yearning for that which we always already intuit and are apparently seeking in <laughs> fruitless means. And can we all enjoy that which we uh, are awakened into as literally as only one? And then the laws in that manifest the signs and demonstration. So he again did that, you know, in his own person in 1999 and then began to. And at a certain point I had to leave because which is not untypical because it began to be too fiery for me. You know, and, and when it starts to get too fiery, I start to get psychophysical symptoms that are really disabling, you know, so it's like cool down time. And I'm not justifying any reasons from why I may have kind of come and gone because like in retrospect, it's always like, oh, I wish I could have done different. But you know what? I had to give that up a long time ago, <laughs> you know, and um, every moment is new. You know, there is there is no binding power in radical understanding. And yet there is also the necessity to continue to make, as he calls, bright changes in the world. Oh. So yes, the 1999 initiated or acknowledged already the culminating revelation of his translation, which was the outshining of any form of entanglement that brought him here which is why he began with the communication relative to the profundity of his relationship to the Siddha lineage. That's what I wanted to share here. So if we think that what's going on relative to Adi Da and Adi Da's work and Adi Dham and the world and devotees, it's a divine process that you must acknowledge if you're going to have any kind of a real wisdom relationship to it or you're going to exercise any kind of intelligence relative to what's happening in the world. And I, I'm not saying this arrogantly or righteously. Um, it's, the, it's the seed root of every true tradition, you know, for this service, this necessity to be given over for the divine purpose and for growth beyond the limits that bring something less than to one another. And, and it's, it's, in, it's in our recognition of, of, of the divine self-condition and the apparent modifications of bright divine person and being and light itself that we live. And if we do that, then our choices would be radically different than what we're making as a collective. There's no question about it. So the call to relationship with him directly was always the, the primary demand. And that meant bodily. And now that his physical body is here, it doesn't mean merely at the brightness because his physical body is entoured. That's a way of, of mythologizing him. Um, the person that he is speaking of is the one that cannot be contained, even though the ego act assumes that it can own and know him. And yet, how do we then, as a collective of, of humanity and as a culture that is much larger than the, the dear devotees who have been at various different times in various different ways, the, the stewards of these gifts, the priests of these gifts, the ones who are supporting these gifts throughout all the decades of his life and continuing, how do we work with the world and feel as wide as necessary to include all the differences? and to enable this recognition that those are the conversations that we need to be having with one another, not about our quibbles. <laughs> yeah, so well, that, I, wa yeah. I, I wanna thank you because I'm looking at the time and I don't mean to cut you off, but I wanna just say how delightful it has been for me and I'm hoping many of the hundreds and thousands of people who will be listening and watching and listening to hear your devotion, but your 
your emphasis that his play and our play and really about the divine play Ooh. and the reason, if you will, for joy, the reason for incarnation, the reason for the manifestation of who he is. It is a divine matter. And mm. once that recognition is fully grasped and the understanding of the limitations that prevent that is clarified and purified, mm. then as you point, the, the real process, the world process mm. can begin mm. the real true manifestation. Mm. of his incarnation. Mm. 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 Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Ed. That's very clear. <laughs> well, thank mm. you, seriously, mm. because you, you, you brought the divine play in the conversation, mm. and that was what you brought, and so I want to honor you for sharing that, and thank you again it's for my taking bliss. the time. <laughs> Stop. It's bliss, love. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and thank you for anybody who is sharing this with us and magnifying it. Yeah, gratitude. Okay, so until next time, mm. I want to say again, thank you. And for mm. those who are listening and watching, thank you for staying with us for this hour plus. And mm. uh, stay tuned and we'll continue our conversations. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>